Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone doing today? Are we doing good? I hope everybody is having a fantastic start to their week. As always, I'm your host, Zach Cronin, and I'm eternally grateful that you would choose to spend a few minutes here with me today. I am, of course, here with another episode of the Hedging Screens podcast. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Much like last week, I am recording this on a Tuesday. That is the day I conduct all my recordings. And we have yet another series clinching game happening tonight. The series in question, Denver and the Los Angeles Clippers. First off, I don't know how we got to this point. I'm just like, I'm flabbergasted. My mind, it's unable to comprehend How we're even here. The Denver Nuggets forced a Game 7 against, arguably, the best team in the Western Conference. They have just been, they've been playing better than the Clippers right now. I'm going to pull up some of the series stats. Just give me one second. Hold up, hold up, hold up. And, of course, this all goes back to Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. But even with that said, how they've been able to even hang with the Clippers is beyond me. This series should have been over last week, should have been over in five games, should have been over in six games. But as we know, the Los Angeles Clippers were unable to finish, to, to seal the deal, basically, after coming out in game one and just straight up mauling Denver. It was the 23-point victory, if my math serves me correct. 23 points. They then lost a heartbreaker in game two. Came back one one games three and four. They're up three games to one. And somehow, some way, the Nuggets just crawl back. They eked out of game five. The final was 111 to 105. Game six was a little bit just, I don't not even a little bit. It was way more of a shocking outcome. It was, what is that, a 13-point 13, 13 defeat for the Clippers? Kawhi Leonard and Paul George were basically on an island, doing it all by themselves, and Paul George wasn't even that great. Yeah, he had 33 points, but he only shot 9-21 of 21 from the floor, and the bulk of his points came from the free throw line, where he went 11 for 11. Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic combined for 55 55. Gary Harris, shout out to Gary Harris. He made an appearance, dropping 16 on 5 of 11 shooting. And then Michael Porter Jr., after complaining about not being so involved, had 13 points and 7 boards. It was a very, a very well orchestrated game from Michael Malone's team. And they're coming into this game 7 on Tuesday night. And by the time this goes up, the series will be decided. I want to go with the Clippers just because they have the talent. They've got Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Two guys, as I've said in the past, they've been there before. They know what the deal is. They passed the postseason vibe check. But part of me is hesitant to pick them. Paul George said a few days ago that he doesn't feel there is any pressure on the Clippers to to win this Game 7. And I think that that's all just a smokescreen. The Clippers are under a tremendous amount of pressure because everybody knows that this should not be a seven-game series. No disrespect to the Nuggets. They are a fantastic young group, but I didn't feel that they had the talent to push it this far. The Clippers are a much deeper team, albeit nobody is playing like that. I'm just going to give you the scoring breakdown. You have Kawhi Leonard leading the team at 26. Paul George next at about 24. There is a tremendous drop-off from that point on. Combined, Marcus Morris and Lou Williams are only giving 22.5 points a game. Trez is at 10.3. They are simply not getting enough on offense to to, to pull away. And the scary, the scary thing, and also the confusing thing, is that their defense really hasn't been that great either. And throughout the season... Ooh, pardon me. Throughout the season, the Clippers established themselves as one of, if not the 
most suffocating defense on the planet. And they had stretches throughout the series where they just totally took away Jamal Murray and Nicole Jokic. I'm trying to remember what game it was. I think it might have been, it was either game three or game four. I think it might have been game three because that was the closer of the two games. But in the fourth quarter, just Paul George and Kawhi Leonard just reached another level defensively. And I don't think that anybody in the history of the league would have been able to score on them at that point. They just looked so above the Denver Nuggets offense. It was just, I thought that was that was it. That was a nail in the coffin. Like the Nuggets will not be able to come back from that because they got manhandled late in the game. And I, I want to give a tremendous amount of credit to the Nuggets for coming back and just even making this an actual series. Like, Jokic has been phenomenal, averaging 26, 12, and 5.5 and assists, shooting 53% from the field, but also 44% from three. Him and Jamal Murray have made the same amount of threes this series. They're also shooting about the same percentage, too. Siri's trying to talk to me. Beyond that, Michael Ford Jr., 11.5 points. Paul Millsap, 10.5. Gary Harris, 10. Like, the Clippers' defense has not been that great, at least in totality. The scoring differential is only two points. The Clippers are at 105.5, Denver's at 103. Denver's shooting splits, 46% overall, 36% from three, 76.5% from the line. Denver could very well go into tonight's game, Tuesday night's game, and catch the Clippers lacking, more or less. Do I expect that? I do not. Pardon me as I inject a little bit of caffeine into my system. This is my little pre-workout. Got to go to the gym after this and move very minimal amounts of weight because gyms are back open here in New York State. And I believe every county except for New York City, which obviously New York City is about three months behind the rest of the state. And uh, I can't say I'm surprised by that, but the point notwithstanding, gyms are open and my strength is at about where it was when I first started working out back when I was in high school. So I need everything I can get. But back to the series. I'm rolling with the Clippers just because in the game seven, you got to go with the better team, I feel like. Especially when the better team, when everyone knows that the better team can be so much better than their opponent. But I'm le- it's like 55-45 for me. I'm not entirely sold on the Clippers, especially how they've been playing the last couple of days. I'm just going to pull up the box score for game six real fast. Denver got outshot. Oh my God, this is so bad. By 13 percentage points. They allowed Denver to shoot 54% from the field. 54. 54. And they shot 41. The Nuggets shot better from three than the Clippers did from the field. If they come out and they shit the bed like that again, I think Denver will take full advantage. They will smell blood and they will go in for the kill. We know that Jamal Murray can put points on the board. And... If the Clippers relent even a little bit, it could get, it could get ugly. Again, I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting the Clippers to punch through to the Western Conference Finals and match up with the Los Angeles Lakers, but this series is a lot more competitive than I anticipated. And with that, I want to focus to the Western Conference Finals as Siri is yet again interjecting, interrupting, and disrupting the flow. The Los Angeles Lakers made quick work of the Houston Rockets. I mean, quick work. It was five games, and there was pretty much nothing Houston could do. I'm just going to, again, pull up the um, the series stats. Just give me one second. But this was very unexpected. I thought that Houston could have pushed the series to six or seven games. Not, not because they're so uberly talented, but 
I was not sold on the Lakers bench. I haven't really been sold on the Lakers bench for the last couple months or so. LeBron was also not performing at the LeBron that we've been accustomed to. Granted, he is 35, and he is starting to... I don't know if his play is starting to deteriorate, but he's definitely picking his spots a lot more strategically. Like, he went off for 36 in Game 3, but he wasn't on like that all the time. And he hasn't really been on like that all the time for most of the season. Like, the scoring numbers for this year is LeBron was a little bit under 26, which is still fantastic. But in past postseasons, like, he's been hovering around 28, 29, 30 sometimes. He is taking a slight back seat to Anthony Davis. And when he feels the game is in jeopardy, that's when he comes alive. But regardless, the Rockets were simply unable to contend with the Lakers. And I thought that this small ball or this micro ball, not even small ball, was going to treat them a lot. It was going to be in their favor more. But Anthony Davis slowly but surely kicked it into high gear and became much more aggressive. He wanted he got the shots that he wanted to get and heading into the series that was something that I felt the Lakers needed to look for they needed to look to get AD involved and not just involved but put the pressure on PJ Tucker put the pressure on Daniel House who <laughs> had the right idea in getting out of the bubble we'll talk we'll talk about that later but Daniel House had an unauthorized guest inside of his uh inside of his hotel room and he, he 86 himself quick. Well, I don't know if he 86 himself, but the NBA was like, listen, bro, you got to get the fuck out of here. Like, I mean, it only takes one. It only takes one to shut this whole shit down. And I'm glad that the NBA acted swiftly in that regard. But getting back to basketball, the Rockets, outside of James Harden, and this has been a reoccurring thing, Ever since the 2016-17 season. Outside of James Harden, the Rockets just don't have it. Harden posted damn near 30 points and shot 50% from the field. Shot 38% from three. He put up incredible numbers. He played fantastic basketball. His teammates played like garbage. Straight up. Russ looked like shit. Eric Gordon looked like shit. Maybe that's a little harsh, but I don't see it that way. Russ, for the series, averaged 20 points, shot 42% from the floor, and just posted horrific numbers from the free throw line. Overall, he shot 14 of 26 from the charity stripe, when previously this man was playing some of the best basketball of his career. He was dominating people because he was playing his game postseason comes well not not necessarily the postseason but this series rolls around and rush just gets taken out of the action he's turning the ball over he's shooting more threes than i'm sure people are comfortable with i mean he was at a little bit more than five a game which is still too much for russell westbrook ideally you want to see him at around three or less because when he's not shooting threes it means that he's getting to the basket or he's getting to the free throw line or he is at least getting to the spots where he's much more accurate. And he simply did not do that. And if those two guys stagnate, well, not even those two guys, because James didn't, but anyone besides him, if they're just like not with it, the Rockets do not stand a chance. They had to play perfectly, and and they did not. They did not. And maybe this series is looking different if it's not for LeBron James and Anthony Davis, but that's that's just the game we can't play because the Lakers have LeBron and they have Anthony Davis. And to be fair, the Lakers bench was pretty reliable. Overall, the team was was pretty capable from 3 at about 30 at about 38%, 37.7 to be exact. Just Danny Green was hitting threes. Markeith Morris was hitting threes. Contavious Caldwell Pope was hitting threes. That's the big thing. If all the other guys are hitting threes, even Kyle Kuzma even Kyle Kuzma was hitting a couple threes. If those guys are locked in from the perimeter, the Lakers are going to be very tough to deal with because the floor at that point 
is way too spaced out for LeBron and AD not to take advantage. And LeBron's passing has been on another level this year. And as we know, Anthony Davis is Anthony Davis. And I do want to credit Rajon Rondo. He led a little bit of, um, I want to, I don't want to say it was a resurgence, but his energy and just all of those intangibles combined with what he actually did on the court, he really helped make the Lakers look different. I mean, he only played, or he he came back for the series, played all five games, had a dominant game one. He just, I think it was game one. It was early in the series where he just came out and the energy shifted entirely. And from that point on, he made the Lakers look like favorites, right? 10.6 points, seven assists, two steals. And I think I talked about this last week, but Rondo gives the Lakers a legitimate backup point guard. Someone who can run the floor, facilitate the offense, and just help keep things fresh. Like, we know what Rondo's done in the past. He's no scrub. He's not a slouch. He he is in elite floor general off the bench. No one's going to take that away from him because you can't. It's, it's the fact of the matter. Now, depending on who they play, who the Lakers play, in the Western Conference Finals. It's going to be either their most difficult series yet or their easiest. I think that if the Denver Nuggets were to push through and dispatch the Clippers, it would be a swift defeat at the hands of the Los Angeles Lakers. Then again, if they do that, they could very well surprise us because I thought the same thing when they were matching up against Kawhi and them. And here we are, recording on the day of a Game 7. So, I don't want to commit too hard one way, but that's just... No, oh, pardon me. That's just what my gut is telling me. Now, the series we all want... <sighs> oh, baby, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one if we get it. Lakers-Clippers could end up being the best series of the playoffs I'm talking just a seven game slugfest from start to finish LeBron and AD Kawhi and Paul George going head to head the benches would ultimately decide that game and if that's the case I'm still leaning towards the Lakers but the Clippers built this team to beat the Lakers That is the sole purpose of this team. And with all the series beforehand, they're just thriving off of talent. But the Clippers have a roster that can contend with the Lakers. They've got a handful of bodies to throw at both LeBron and AD. There's Trez. There's Patrick Patterson. There is, of course, Kawhi and Paul George. There's Zubak. Moreover... They have Lou Williams, and Lou Williams is going to play a very important role if this series should manifest because there is nobody on the Lakers that can do what Lou Williams does. The Lakers do not have a third guy who can consistently give 15 to 22 points. They don't. And I know Lou Williams is having a tough go against the Nuggets, but I mean, he's been in this thing for a long time. I think he'll bounce back. Maybe he'll have to go back to that strip club in Atlanta and get some of those lemon pepper, those lemon pepper Lou wings. But I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But again, the Lakers just, they don't have anyone of that caliber. And I know I just raved about Rajon Rondo, but Rondo and Lou Williams are two different kinds of players. Rondo has his upsides and Lou Williams has his, but they don't, they don't really go hand in hand. They, they, they just don't. And the Clippers bench, at least to me, is stronger, at least as far, at least on paper. These papers that I'm looking at, the box scores say differently, but I know a lot of people are going to pick the Clippers again. 
This is all under the assumption that the Clippers actually come through tonight. <laughs> Which, I I don't even want to backtrack and get into that. Just know that there are a lot of people going to be picking the Clippers and a lot of people that are going to be picking the Lakers, and neither side is going to be wrong. I just don't think that anyone should hard commit to one side because it's a coin flip. When you have two teams that are as talented as, the, as these, anything can happen. And of course, when you have LeBron James on your team, anything can happen. So I'm fi- I'm like 51-49 Lakers right now, and I'm not that type of guy who's going to stick with the Lakers the entire series. Like I just, I'm going to observe the situation, and if the Clippers come out and they go up 2-0, I'm going to lean toward the Clippers. Because that, like, that's just assessing the situation properly. Like the Clippers, obviously, in that case, would have the upper hand, and the Lakers would need to fight back and gain the respect to actually, you know, go back and pick them. But with all that said, I want to stay in the Western Conference for a minute. Uh, actually, no, I don't. I want to jump over to the East just because I want to get all of the, um, all of the conference finals talk out of the way. Now, Celtics, Miami is the Eastern Conference Finals. They are also tipping off tonight. I think at 6 o'clock Eastern. Of course, one game isn't really going to dictate too much, but this... I am very excited to watch this series. First off, Jason Tatum is just spectacular. He's spectacular. There, There is no other way to describe him. In, against the Toronto Raptors, this man averaged 24 points, 10 boards, and about 5 assists. Shot 42% overall. Not that great, but that series was just... Oh my god, it was so gritty and so hard fought. And watching that Game 7 was just amazing. And then even the Game 6, like the final two games of those series of that series was... It was elite playoff basketball and it was what you would expect stars made plays except for pascal siakam he did not make any plays <laughs> dude was looking like a pack of king hawaiians kings what kings hawaiian straight buns bro i'm just i'm keeping it i'm keeping it a buck pascal was not looking good but tatum was and that's largely why boston was able to punch through in this series Of course, you got some help from Jalen Brown, from Marcus Smart. Kemba Walker, I felt, was a little underwhelming, but he still gave them 17. And ultimately, the Celtics just played, they just played better basketball. That Yeah, there you go. They took advantage of the Raptors faltering, and they walked away with the series. Good on them. I feel that the Celtics have a legitimate chance to go to the finals now. And the way that they locked down Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam was just, it was a masterclass in defensive efficiency. Both of those guys were consistently over 40 minutes, as was Kyle Lowry, but Kyle Lowry managed to, you know, break out every now and then. Both of those guys were consistently playing over 40 minutes a night, and part of their bad performance was fatigue, I understand, but I mean, the Celtics, they got bodies, bro. They got length, they got size. I mean, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, on the perimeter, like it is, they are a scary combination. They they are like Kawhi and Paul George light, and we saw that. Their defensive prowess prowess was on full display. They held both Siakam and Fred Van Vliet to sub forty percent from the field. Fred Van Fred Van Vliet is going to get a max contract in free agency. Pascal Siakam is one of the best young players in the league right now. He's not the best, though. Jason Tatum is definitely ahead of him. And I think Jason Tatum could carry the Celtics to a victory over the Miami Heat. Now, as we know, the Miami Heat got very lucky. I don't, like, they they just walked all over the Milwaukee Bucks somehow. I mean, that's just, I don't even know if I want to talk about that because it's just disgusting. I feel embarrassed, thoroughly embarrassed. But um, this is going to be another... Slugfest. The Miami Heat, they know that they should not be here, but here they are. Here they are. And they're not going to give an inch. These two teams are very evenly matched. 
and I, I'm just excited to watch these next. I hope I hope it's six or seven games. I'm just I'm so excited to watch. A little bit more caffeine. Um, I really have nothing else to say on this series. I kind of want to hold my thoughts and just. Pardon me. <laughs> Got a little bit of cotton mouth going on. Trying to, trying to. I don't. I don't even know what the fuck I'm trying to do. But it's it's tough talking to to nobody. <laughs> you have no time to like sit back and just chill. But this is my bed. I, I this is the bed I made. I'm gonna lay in it. And again, I just I want I really want to just see a couple of these games, and then talk about it. I mean, I'll give a prediction. I'm going with Boston. Am I? I, bro, I don't know. I really I don't know. I want to go with Boston because to me they're the better team, but they're not that much better than the Heat. Only a couple of games separated them in the standings, I believe. I'm probably talking about out of my ass here. Uh, no, only four games, five games in the in the lost column, four overall, I think. So there's really not that big of a margin in between these teams. And of course, one team has Jimmy Butler. Um, I think I, I'm gonna stick with the Celtics for right now, just just tentatively, just so I can give you guys a prediction going into the series. But what I really want to spend some time talking about is the Houston Rockets because as I watched this team get clapped by LeBron and AD, as I watched Russell Westbrook throw the games away, as I watched shot after shot brick just careen off the side of the backboard, I couldn't help but think to myself, where do they go next? Where do the Houston Rockets go from here? I don't think anybody knows. I think it was... It was either yesterday or two days ago. News came out that Mike D'Antoni and the Rockets are not going to continue their relationship. So Mike D'Antoni is a coaching free agent. He might retire. He might go to the Sixers. He might go to Indiana. He might go to Chicago. He could do whatever he wants. I don't know if this team can break through their current ceiling. Because what the Rockets have done here is they have made one player their system. That player being James Harden. And it has not worked for them. It's worked for Harden, of course, who's put up a shitload of points since coming over to Houston. Won an MVP. You know, he's always in the running for the MVP because he puts up numbers and because the Rockets perform. They traded Chris Paul away, brought in Russell Westbrook. Decision The decision was a little sus, but Daryl Morey felt that he could mortgage his team's future for someone that could help them win now. And for half the season, when Russell Westbrook was on, it looked like a good move. But now, you got to think. Both Harden and Russ are getting older. Russ's play is going to deteriorate at a faster rate than James Harden's, mainly because Harden's game is a lot more skill-based, whereas Russ leans heavily on his athleticism. If he's not running by people or jumping over them, he's not operating at his peak. James, on the other hand, has his handle. He plays the game his own pace. He's never sped up too fast, never slows down too fast. He just has a deeper bag, and he's a more creative and a more talented scorer than Russ is. So I saw on my IG yesterday that an anonymous, I think an anonymous Eastern Conference exec said that, and I'm paraphrasing here, if Russ is tradable, you trade him. Now, Russell Westbrook is not tradable. I don't think so. Not at this moment. And it's because of his contract. Harden and Russ. Oh my God. Over the next 
Well, let's do next season. Together, they are guaranteed $81 million. The next year, 86. The following year, 92. At least I think 46 and 46 is 92. I think so. Yep, 92. I just... I don't... I don't know how you're going to offload either one of those deals. Granted, you don't have to offload Harden because he's still going to be hopefully worth most of that money as he gets older. Russ, on the other hand, that's that's the big if. How many people are going to want to trade for an aging point guard who is who's making the super duper max and who has had problems with injuries in the past? And again, his production is going to drop off. I don't think Russ is going to be the next Chris Paul, where he just continues to put up numbers this late into his career. Chris Paul is very much like James Harden in the sense that his game was never based on his athleticism. I mean, being a smaller guy, he had to be crafty. He had to be a dribbling savant. He had to be creative. They're not getting that with Russ. And I don't think that this team is really ever going to do anything. Even if they bring in a new coach. Daryl Morey is still the GM. This whole... I don't even know what to call it. It's like pacing space on steroids. It's like... Just... The Rockets don't think like the rest of of the league. And it's to their detriment almost. Because they don't play for great shots. They would rather get 20 good shots instead of 10 great shots. That's what it looks like when I watch them play. Because possession after possession, they just get the ball, they dribble it up court, they pass it around a few times, and they jack up a three. If not, the only other type of possession they have is James Harden holds onto the ball for 20 seconds, does a through-the-leg crossover combo 13 times, and then either gets to the free throw line or steps back and misses a three or makes a three. Those are the two possessions I see from them. There is no system. There is no, like, sc- there is no scheme. Mike D'Antoni never had a scheme. His scheme on the whiteboard, on the little, on the whiteboard, on the tablet, it would just say James Harden. That would be it. Because he's their offense. They didn't do anything innovative. Well, they did do something innovative, but, like, they never adapted. Like, The Warriors, for example, created a dynasty because they had this unique play style. But as teams adjusted to try to beat them, they kept things fresh. That's what separates great organizations from good ones. Say what you will about the Warriors, dude. But the mark they left on basketball, it's never going away. And say what you will about Steve Kerr. He might not be that great of a coach, but he at least had something for his players to fall back on. There was ball movement. There was player movement. They're running Klay Thompson off pin downs. They're running Steph through elevator screens. They're running Draymond along the baseline, looking for him to create. The Rockets don't do any of that. And I'm not sure that the next coach that they bring in is going to be able to do anything like that. Because they have this play style. And they're going to stick to it. And this isn't like the player's fault either. We know James Harden. We know what James Harden can do. And he's going to do that regardless of what the system is. Because at the end of the game, when the Rockets need to score, the ball is going to be in his hands. And I'm sure Harden is open to just, you know, little tweaks. Because it's just been beat down after beat down after beat down for this dude. I'm sure that he's sick of it. And my hope is that they find a way to make it work. Because I think that they'd be a better they'd be better off, first of all, on the floor, because they wouldn't be so one dimensional. And if you think about it, it is quite easy to guard the Houston Rockets. Because you don't have to worry about anybody else other than James Harden. As long as you can give a good closeout, you can defend the Rockets. That's that's really all that's really all it is. If you sprinkle in some ball movement, 
you know, actually start passing the rock. Make more use of P.J. Tucker, Cove, Eric Gordon. You know, these guys are all talented players. And we know that they're talented. But they're almost hard-capped. Because the roles in the quote-unquote system are very rigid. Whose fault is that? I think it's coming from the top of the top. Even if Mike D'Antoni wanted to do something, I don't know if that if that was the case. I I don't because it's been four like five years of just the same shit every year. Like I've never seen a team just I've never seen a good team just fail to move to move the arrow in either direction. Like that 2016-2017 Houston Rockets team was so just... They were S-tier. Top to bottom. They were fantastic. Defensively. That was a big thing. Their defense was just unreal. But ownership changes. Trevor Ariza goes away. Luke Mbamute goes away. And then all of a sudden, you're just left with this shell. The husk of what was once a contender. Then this year, they bounced back. They traded for Robert Covington, which I thought was I thought it was a good deal. I'm not gonna say it was great because I uh, just look at the deal. Actually, no, I'm gonna take that back. It was a good deal. It fit what the Rockets wanted to do, and that's why they did it. And yet, you still can't break through your glass ceiling. Something has to change. Something has to change. Because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and thinking the outcome is going to change. The outcome has not changed. You got to rework something. You have to. Like, if the Rockets if the Rockets start the next season and they're running the same scheme, quote-unquote, I have my air quotes up, and they're running the same scheme, they're going to get embarrassed again. Because we know it doesn't work. We know that it's going to fail. Because we've watched it fail multiple years in a row. Like, there just has to be an entirely new rework of everything. And maybe they just trade Russell Westbrook away to get off his contract. But if not, they're going to have to find a way to just work around it. And I think the big thing is just this isolation heavy this isolation heavy let me try this again for the third time these isol- these isolation heavy sets they just they don't work they don't work you need more variety in your offense it just it has to be like you have all these guys because they're versatile right you're playing micro ball so that way you can be more agile and more mobile on the defensive end well take advantage of that on offense too like why are you not maximizing the talent that you have it's just absurd to me and this is me as a fan. I'm not working for an NBA team. I'm not an executive anywhere. I'm not a scout. I'm not a player development guy. But anyone who knows basketball and who's played basketball and who studies basketball knows that just going one-on-one all the time can only get you so far. Like, we've seen it throughout history. The best teams had multiple angles of attack. The only time, honestly, the only time it's ever worked is when LeBron and Kyrie won in, what was that, 2016? Yeah, 2016. That was the only time it worked. And it worked because of LeBron James. There is no other LeBron James out there right now. As far as I'm concerned, no one will ever be able to do what he did back then ever again. It was just historic. Never never before seen, never will be seen again. So the Rockets, like, they got to do something. And I really don't have any of the answers right now because, like, the offseason isn't even underway yet. And something could change. Maybe Daryl Morey has an epiphany and realizes that this thing that he's tried to build, it's like it's cute, it's charming, but it's not getting the results that everyone thought it would. And I'm just... I'm going to end my rant there. Like, I think I ranted. 
I ranted on the Rockets for about 14 minutes. Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'm going to shift over to the, um, what is it, the fantasy football side of the podcast. Just give you all an update on where I'm at in my fantasy football season. So, week one, congratulations to everybody who came out on top. And my condolences to everyone who lost, whether you lost by one point, whether you lost... Well, whether you lost by 50 points, whether you lost because Saquon Barkley just forgot how to play football last night. 15, what was it, six yards on 15 carries? I don't know, bro. Something's going to change. I didn't watch the game because I was too busy getting my ass beat in Warzone, but, like, I'm going to I'm gonna hold out for Saquon. I think he'll pick it up. I think he'll get into a rhythm sooner rather than later, but all I know is the Steelers' defense is not God tier. So, week one. I fell short of my projection. Unfortunately, I was projected about 147 and finished with 135, mostly because Michael Thomas shit the bed, right? Patty Mahomes did great on Thursday Night Football. Mari Cooper had a very solid outing, 10 receptions, 81 yards. Calvin Ridley went off. Shout out to Calvin Ridley. I knew he was, I knew, I knew he was going to steal all those touchdowns. From Julio Jones, I just I knew it. I had to grab him. That's why Chris Carson had a surprisingly decent outing despite being held to 21 yards rushing yards. Pardon me. Um, the rest of the team, I got a decent performance from Henry Ruggs, uh, Boston Scott nowhere to be found, and Austin Hooper was just a dud. But I guess that's what happens when you have Baker Mayfield throwing ducks out there. Um, yeah, the big thing. Oh, by the way, I shit on my friend Chris this week. I'm sorry, I beat his ass by like 60 points or something. It was just, it was rough. And he had, yeah, dude, he had Evan Ingram going last night, and Ingram just, uh, I don't know, bro. The Giants are going to be tough to watch this year. Uh, I'm, I'm not ready for it. But, I mean, the big thing was just Michael Thomas. I mean, five targets, three receptions, 17 yards. He... Is dealing with a little bit of an ankle injury now. I hope he's okay. Um, if the Saints wind up do like not going to him, or they hold on, let's try that again. That's not English. If the Saints wind up not looking his way for, for a few weeks, just until he gets that ankle under control, I think I'll be all right. Because it's still early in the season, and I'd rather have I'd rather him put up those dud performances now than later on, like in the playoff race and even in the playoffs. So I'm not too worried. And I also think that, you know, just the whole COVID situation with the NFL, not having preseason games, just going pretty much right into the season. I think a lot of people are still struggling to get into their, into their rhythms because this is almost like their preseason, except it's a preseason where the games count and the starters are playing a lot. Like you can't just ease your guys into playing, you know, 80, 90, 100 possessions or snaps, if you will. I think that Michael Thomas will come will come along later. Um, I think that ultimately I might have to flip one of these receivers for another quality running back because even like the bench, the only guy I could have put in there, I mean, well, DeAndre Swift had a decent outing and um, Sony Michelle also had a solid outing. They went for 11, about 11 and 10 points, respectively. Um, I'll, I'm just going to see what happens. I thought that Scott had the better matchup against the um, against the Redskins. Um, I don't know. And Switz was hurt. I don't want to say he was hurt, but he was questionable for most of last week. And I, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really hurt. And I got the dub, so like honestly, it doesn't matter. But I'd, I'd be feeling some type of way if I did lo- if I did lose, and the difference was about four points, and I couldn't made that up with DeAndre Swift, but um, I think Sony Michelle might be my guy for later on in the season. Like, as long as he's getting consistent touches, I mean, Cam really was the focal point for the Patriots in week one, and maybe that'll change later on, but his, his ground game, like, whew, man, dangerous. I mean, they might not have to fucking have a running back. Like, he'll be, out, like, Sony Michelle will just be out there doing cardio as a decoy while Cam rushes for it for 1100 yards and 13 touchdowns. But I mean, I don't know, dude, this week is, uh, this week 
this week's going to be a good matchup. I'm going up against my friend Denim. Yes, Denim like pants. And, like, this is... He's projected to beat me by one point. I mean, we got Patty Mahomes and Lamar Jackson facing off at the quarterback spot. We're pretty evenly matched in um, the wide receiver department as well. He's got Tyler Lockett, Marquise Brown, and Marvin Jones Jr. Um, I definitely have the edge, at least on paper. But, again, like, any of those guys are liable to go off. I had Marquise Brown last year, and this dude was hot for a little bit, but then just fucking fell off a cliff. Just could not get anything going. But what are you going to do? He does have Alvin Kamara, and that scares me a lot, Um, as well as Kareem Hunt. I don't even really know how Kareem Hunt did last week. 12? Not bad. I mean, Kareem Hunt, like, he's just not really. He doesn't really scare me that much. He, He for sure has the matchup. You know, the tight end department. George Kittle, who is questionable this week. So I'm I'm a, he's gonna fucking beat the brakes off of Austin Hooper in this matchup. I mean I'm excited. I'm excited for a very stressful Sunday. And with that, I'm going to end this one. Thank you guys very much for listening. Please leave a review and a rating on whatever platform you listen to. It really helps me a lot. Also be sure to like, subscribe, follow whatever you got to do, and I will see you guys next week.